Welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast, hosted by Dave Roberts. Humanity possesses a unique skill, the ability to pass knowledge from one generation uh, to the next. This podcast embraces that ability, offering learning opportunities through conversations with extraordinary guests. Dave aims to leave a positive mark on individuals around the world. So before you dive into today's episode, please share this podcast with your network, including friends, family, and colleagues. And please consider leaving a rating or review. Your support makes all the difference. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I'm your host, Dave Roberts. Today, it is my pleasure to have as my guest, Faith Sage. Faith Sage is a published author, podcast host, and grief mentor. Driven by her love of helping women through grief and sharing their stories, Faith takes pride in being a cheerleader for humanity and helping others by sharing their stories and cheering them on. In addition to her primary job functions, Faith Sage has been recognized by the president for her extraordinary commitment to volunteering, her clients for her unending support, and by her family for always making time for them. Faith lives in the frozen tundra of Minnesota with her husband and their blended family. Faith, welcome to the Teaching Journeys podcast. It's an absolute pleasure having you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly my honor and my pleasure to be on the show. You're welcome. We met, I think, on Facebook, and then we connected. It was my honor and a pleasure to be a guest on your Release Grief podcast, and I had just a great experience with that. And we're obviously going to be talking more about Release Grief later in the show because I know our audience will be interested to hear the inspiration for it and how it aligns with the work that you're currently doing. My first question for you is please tell our listeners about the experiences that have shaped your life path and your life passions. Wow, good question. So let's see. There's a few instances that shaped my journey, especially moving into the grief world, because let's face it, nobody wants to teach in the grief world. It's heavy. It's difficult. It takes an emotional toll, and I don't care who you are, it takes an emotional toll on you. And then you always question, why am I here? Why am I doing this? What's the purpose? Do I need to continue? Is this really my life's journey? In 2014, we had a small family. We had five children between us, and he was the main breadwinner. So I wanted to support him however I could, and that meant helping take care of our five children, which I didn't think. I was doing a good job of because I was traveling 45 minutes one way for work and then back. So I was looking for a work from home job. And so I found one and with copywriting, building website, the technical stuff. Um, So that was the first foray into the online world. Otherwise, I hadn't been in it. Wasn't it wasn't in my sphere of thing. And so I went to a copywriting seminar that they had, and I took my two daughters with me, Cassandra and Chaney. And we drove down there. I immersed myself into it. Then in 2016, my daughter, Cassandra, we lost her in a freak vehicle accident. She was 19. She was one of the ones that was... At Christmas time, she would support me by giving me journals. Write your thoughts down. I want to hear your stories. I want to do all these things. And so at that time... Of course, we were devastated and it took us, it, I wanted to create a program to help people that were going through the loss of a child. And I had the outline done. I had the course already ready to go. All I literally had to do was record the videos. I had everything up on, so on, on a platform and everything ready to roll, but I hesitated. I didn't want to pull the trigger. I felt if this was my voice, did I have a voice in this? Because she was my stepdaughter. She wasn't my biological daughter. Who am I to talk about this? And so I hesitated. I waited. In 2021, I lost my four-year-old granddaughter in another freak vehicle accident. It was at that point in time I pulled the trigger to go into the grief world. So I sat on it for multiple years, gaining knowledge, wanting to be in the world, 
because I felt like I had a voice, but not at the same time, if that makes sense. But then I pulled the trigger and in 2021, I made the full leap into helping people in grief, specifically mothers and grandmothers that have lost a child. And I think that's a noble cause and a noble way to re-engage in life with purpose and meaning. And the other thing you'd mentioned that you weren't sure how much of a voice you had because Cassandra was your stepdaughter. To me, I always look at the meaning of the relationship. I've talked to, to step parents who have considered their stepsons and stepdaughters to be their biological children. It's always, Absolutely. and you take a look at it, it's we're grieving with the significance of that relationship to us. If we see an individual as, our, as one of our family and our biological family, we are going to grieve it. And to me, that makes our grief more powerful. If we can own our grief and we can own that to yeah. say, this was my daughter. And that's one of the things that I talked about to individuals with bereavement support is what is the significance of that relationship to you? Did you see that person as part of your family? If so, you're going to grieve it accordingly. And yeah. we throw those traditional expectations about what family means out the window when it comes to, to the, the depth of the relationships. And I'm glad you, you found that to be true for yourself and are, and are re-engaging and helping other women and grandparents as a result of your own challenges. So I think that's a great mission to be on, Faith. Thank you. It was super weird at first because no one was talking about the step-parent relationship with the child and the loss that they suffer as well because you're right. It's just, I didn't actually birth her, but I had put my blood, sweat, and tears into this relationship mm. um, for 11 years before her passing. And so it was, I carted her everywhere with me. Like she was part of the flock. You go where I go. And so everyone in my family knew her. Everyone, it was just, she was my daughter in all sense of the purposes. Yeah. And we could take step out of the equation. And I do, I only clarify that it's step because there's so many people that come into this roadblock. Am I going to tread on the mother's feelings and validations? And how does that impact my grief versus her grief and our grief together as a family? There's so many dynamics that fall into that. Like, it's interesting when you break it all down. It is, and it just proves that grief is a very complex emotion. It's a very complex journey because there's so many factors that nuance factors that contribute to the uniqueness of each individual's grief journey. Even if you share the same loss, whether it's a loss of a child, the loss of a spouse, there's always those, there are, those unique characteristics that make it different, even though the pain of loss and the type of loss is very similar. And I think as grief coaches, bereavement support specialists, as therapists, we need to be aware of those individual nuances so that we can do appropriate and targeted support. I agree. I think also just getting to know yourself a little bit more and being okay with your responses and your reactions to the grief that's at hand, not simplifying it. Cause I had simplified it so much. that I don't have a voice anymore, mm -hmm. but not also like overcomplicating it so much that my voice is more important than everyone else's either. So just understanding my own self, and my own grief going through it and just being true to who I am to honor her. It's important because if we're not true to ourselves, anybody that we are companioning is going to see that. And we're mm -hmm. not going to be able to invite them or engage them in, in any type of a, a therapeutic relationship if they don't see that we are genuine with where we're coming from. I, and I, right. And I've told my students at Utica University, if you're going to get into the work of doing grief counseling or grief support, you need to be very much aware of your own attitudes regarding depth. You need to be comfortable talking about depth. You need to be comfortable about holding space for somebody who is going to go to the depths of their own pain. And you need to be comfortable mm -hmm. enough to be able to, to hold space for that and to be able to hold the energy of that grief without it compromising your self-care. Yeah. Yeah, because it looks so different for everyone. People don't show much emotion at all, but other people show everything. Yeah. And it's okay either way. Yeah, I, I agree because some individuals will be very emotive. They'll wear their emotions on their sleeves. Other individuals will work through their emotions 
We'll find some other ways to channel those emotions, but they're still grieving as intensely. It's just different, and we need to be able to recognize that and be able to respect that. And again, as I like to say, hold space for it. Yes, I agree with that. Please tell our audience, if you would, about your daughter, Cassandra, and your granddaughter, Peyton. Sure. So Cassandra, when I met her, when I when she first came into my world, she was this little quiet and shy little seven-year-old. And she, I don't know, just the, she had this quality about her as we grew. The kids both called me mom. And when I met their father, he was the first person in my world that had children that I had dated. Uh, usually I was the one that had children and bringing them into the relationship. But he had children. And so I'm like, oh, this is interesting. This is new for me. So I decided when I met these little children that I didn't want to be the Disney version of stepmother. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be the horrible, mean uh, person. So how can I go about making sure that I'm not? Because it's not on the children. It's on me. And I decided also that no matter what happened, I would get along with the mom because and I wanted to honor her just as well. And I didn't want to come in to take over anything. I want to come in and just plug myself in where I could. And so from the very first moment, like it was, we just connected. I just treated her as my own. And we went camping together. We went to family reunions together. We went to wherever I went, she went. And it turned into this wonderful relationship where we would sit there and we would actually have, we were our go-to talk to each other. Things were hard in my world, just different family dynamics, and she would help guide me through those, obviously at a later age. Um, and so that was the big gist of our conversation. We just, we communicated with each other on such a different level that, and she, it's just like she understood who I was. And then she'd wrap you in these big old bear hugs. And she was a family first kind of person. Like she wanted family to stay together. She wanted to bring in like pancake breakfasts on Sunday. And she wanted to see her siblings, all of them, and see the nieces and nephews that were now starting to be born. And so just having a blast with that. It sounds like in many ways that Cassandra was an old soul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 100%. And that uh, her sense of responsibility and commitment was belied her years. Yeah, absolutely. The one thing that I think was really key is that when Cassandra came into your life as your stepdaughter, you made sure that her biological mother, her mother was part of the equation. You wanted mm -hmm. to develop a relationship with her as well too. And I think that is so key because that sends a message to Cassandra too, that of in terms of family is just simply not what was in this household. There's no this household. boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. There's no boundaries with family. And I think that sent a very powerful message to her at a young age. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I think many blended families will make the mistake of is seeing the let's say, a, a biological parent as being a threat to the serenity of the family that they're trying to create, when in reality, they can be an asset to the family that they're trying to create. Absolutely. I do want to clarify one thing, though. Okay. So even though, like, I made the distinction that I was going to, or the decision that I was going to make sure that my relationship with their mother was good, it doesn't mean that everything was always great. Oh, yeah. It doesn't mean that we went to the bar and kicked back drinks and stuff on a Friday night. We didn't do that, but we were civil enough with each other that we could. So two of the children in the blended family, they're two and a half months apart. And so when they graduated high school, we threw a combined graduation party. But it wasn't like we were hanging out every day and calling each other on the phone. At that point in time, it was just, OK, she's mom. I'm stepmom. And we're going to make this work. However it looks, whatever it looks like, we'll make this work. Our relationship didn't transcend into hanging out with each other until after Cassandra's passing. It was, it started in the form of, okay, we're going to have poker parties once a month just to bond, just to connect. And we still do those eight years later. We still have those parties. 
But now we've went on vacation and taken children who are adults now, the ones that could afford to go. Like we went to Vegas one year and then we drove and to Utah and from that trip and the kids that could afford it went. And so there's some from her previous marriage, some from my previous marriage, some together. So we have this huge group of people, but that was after the fact. I just wanted to make that clarification. A lot of people think that, okay, now we're going to be buddies. Now we have to go to dinner every Thursday night. We need to go to have coffee every Sunday morning. That's not it, what I'm saying at all. Let the relationship grow as it needs to, but just hold space for that person in that relationship because if they hadn't come into your spouse's life, those children would not be here. Yeah. And definitely early on, you wanted her position as Cassandra's mother. You wanted that. And yeah. you're right. I mean, it doesn't mean that just because you invite somebody into a relationship, it means everything's going to be all hunky-dory. There's going to be conflicts. No. There's going to be disagreements. Like everything got to work at it. Like, she respects me and I respect her. Like, it's a mutual relationship. And that's all that matters. I mean, you may not like each other, but you can respect each other. Or you may not mm -hmm. see eye-to-eye and everything, but you still respect each other. And right. I think that's the biggest key. But the fact that you laid that groundwork early for that to happen, understanding the challenges moving forward, I think was very key in terms of bringing all that together, bringing the blend, blended family that you now had together. So what about Peyton? Tell me a little bit. Of, tell us a little bit about Peyton. I know she was four years old. She also oh. died as a result of, result of a freak car accident. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. Ooh. That little girl, let me tell you what, from the moment she was born, we clicked. Boom. That was a little buddy. We, I could calm her down. I could, could make her smile. Like we had just had this very ethereal connection. I don't even know how else to describe it. But that girl was spitfire and adrenaline. Let me tell you, she was nonstop go. And she was always testing the limits. Even at the age of four, two, three, four, it didn't matter. She was testing the limits um, to see. So we have, we split wood. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get these big logs that are dropped off at our place. And so I go outside one morning and I see her standing. And of course they land all these weird ways, whatever. She's on the top of one. And I'm like, get down. Like, cause they're so dangerous to crawl and you never know if they're going to shift. And the next moment I go outside and she's sitting on top of our garage roof. And I'm like, get down. What are you doing? And her little sister's trying to crawl up there. I'm like, no, get down. What are you doing? And so she's just they're all hunky dory, her arms on her knees, just looking out and surveying the property. And I'm like, girl, you are too much. And so this was her spirit. She's blonde hair, blue eyed and just bouncing everywhere. But we had definitely had a connection as well. Like going back with Cassandra, we had a special connection as well. And she was the complete opposite. She had long, dark brown hair and big brown eyes. And it was just, I don't know, my girl, I call her my girl. Sounds like she had a beautiful energy about her. Just Did. very joyful, very playful, very adventurous. Yes. And, um, yeah, I, I could just picture that as you were describing it. I had this like very vivid picture in my mind of exactly how she presented herself uh, to the world. Oh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about grandparent grief. And this is a, an issue, for, not an issue, but it's something I had to deal with as well, too. When after my daughter, Janine, I, I call a transition to a new existence over 21 years ago. She transitioned 10 months after giving birth to her first and only child, Brianna. And mm -hmm. I know what I went through with the challenges of grandparent grief, but I wanted to ask you, did you find that grandparent grief presented more unique challenges in parental grief? And if so, what were those challenges? And also, did you see any similarities between grandparent grief and parental grief? Oh, man. So this one here, I remember, first of all, so... With this, when this one happened, my husband and I, we were reciting our house. And of course, it's in the middle of COVID. So no connection. Everything's like limited, all this stuff. Can't find stuff. The products, you can't find them. So we had to drive five hours to get siding for our house. And so we were going to, we hooked it up, put the truck and trailer up, whatever. And we're going to drive on a Saturday morning to go get this stuff. 
my son and his wife and their children were living with us at the time because they were transitioning into buying their own house, whatever. And so we thought that morning, we're like, oh, we should take Peyton with us or we should take one of the grandkids with us. My thought was we should take Peyton. And so we get up, we make pancakes with the grandkids, you know, and then we're like, no, she's not going to sit in a vehicle for five hours. Like it's going to be more five hours one way. So it's 10 hour trip. It's going to take us all day. She's not going to want to sit in this vehicle with us for this long. So we don't take her. <laughs> so we no more than get to the place to pick up the siding and whatnot. And I get the phone call from my son. Instantly, your heart just drops and something's wrong. Like when they're calling you and crying, something is terribly wrong. And when he told us at that time that she didn't make it, there's a pretty big luck that she didn't make it. And I'm like, oh, my God. And so, of course, we're five hours away. That relationship that I mentioned earlier with the stepmother, my son, my stepson, technically, um, called his mom to go be with my son at the hospital because I couldn't be there. And he knew that they would need someone. And so she sat with them and brought them back home from the hospital and everything like that until I could get there. And just made sure that they were safe and okay. We get there that night. And of course, our world is turned upside down again. But there's so many different dynamics that go into each law. That there are, of course, a, an abundance of similarities. But there's also an abundance of not similarities either. Mm -hmm. Like differences and uniqueness. Um, I, ver I liken... Peyton's passing to Cassandra's and that it was Cassandra's passing 2.0. I'm back into it again. I'm feeling these emotions again. I'm having to navigate this again, except now I'm navigating this grief through the eyes of my son. And so I helped him plan the funeral, him and his wife. I helped them plan the funeral. And I just kept thinking, what if no one was here with them? How would they make it through? But then I'm like, okay, we made it through. They mm -hmm. would have done it. They would have made it through just fine, I'm sure. But at that moment in time, you're so emotionally charged. Anything and everything would go. And so I'm, I'm looking at them and seeing the distraughtness that they were going through, it just brought me right back to when we planned Cassandra's. You go right back to that same thing. It's almost like you did no healing whatsoever and you get shoved right back into it. But then coming out of it is a lot quicker because you did do the healing. Mm -hmm. You did do the steps. You did know. So you have that tool belt. So there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of not. That makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. And for me, one of the things I always saw grandparent grief as a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. for me, I was grieving the loss of the Janine, their lack of physical presence in this world. I was grieving that as well as grieving for myself for, and also for my granddaughter who wasn't old enough to grieve. So I found myself grieving for two people, which drained mm -hmm. my energy even more. I huh. grieve for her daughter. I grieve for myself. I grieve for my family, and and a lot of times in early grief, when I saw a behavior that reminded me of, of my daughter, it was bittersweet because yeah. it was great that I could see the spirit of my daughter and my granddaughter, but mm -hmm. also in early grief was a reminder of what I had lost and who I had lost. Yeah, And so for many ways, it was a double-edged sword. But 21 years later, when my granddaughter does something now, she's 22 years old now, when she does something that reminds me of my daughter, I realize it's a reminder that my daughter is still here as opposed right. to being absent. So yeah. that, that's just a shift in perspective. But for me, it was a double-edged sword. Yeah. So our Cassandra didn't have any children. We have nothing she wasn't married. She didn't have any children. She just barely started her life. She was 19. Yep. And she had just moved down south of us by about two hours. About, no, about an hour and a half um, south of the cities here in Minnesota and just beginning her life. And so she didn't have children. So we have to find other ways to keep her memory alive and do things. 
Same with Peyton. Obviously, Peyton didn't have children either, so we have to do things to keep her memory alive as well. Absolutely, and it also gets into what you talked about earlier in terms of their similarities, but there also may be differences. Yeah, I think that when we first got the call with Peyton, it was like this familiar friend was taking my hand, and I knew we were about to go on another walk. Yep. And that's what it felt like. It's an old friend, and here we go again. Yeah, and every loss we experience, we go through the same progression of grief. We go through the same physical, emotional, psychological, cognitive changes. There isn't like any... There isn't like a, any shortcut because we've gone through the process the first no. or second time. We have to go through it again with every loss, and we need to in order to work through that. And I think it makes it different with the relationship that you have with the person. Yep. As you know, is the to the extent of the grief and how you need to heal it. Yep. Um, say I was estranged from Cassandra, or whatever. Or say it's my father and I was estranged from him, whatever. The grief would hit differently than how it did hit. And Guilt that you feel towards that person will impact your grief substantially. Yeah, it certainly will and something that will need to be worked through. And guilt manifests, I think, in, in every grief journey for one reason or another. And it's our ability to rephrase, reframe that. It's our ability to make mm -hmm. sense of it, to understand where it's coming from, and to move through that is going to be one of the keys to getting to the other side Absolutely. of grief. Absolutely. Speaking of grief, what has grief taught you about yourself and your relationship to the world around you? Oh, geez. A lot. So first off, I'm not motivated by money anymore. When I went into the online space in 2014, I wanted to make money so that I was a contributing factor to our household financially and that it would make sense for me to be at home with the children and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After Cassandra passed, I wasn't motivated by money anymore because I'm like, that's not the real issue in the world. You can make money at any point in time. I can go get a job at Walmart and make money. I can go wherever and make money, but I can't make relationships, especially not with that person. And so I started turning everything into how can I be better at communication, making sure that I'm present in the moment with the people I'm around, making sure that they know without a shadow of a doubt that I love them, that it's not just words that are thrown out of my mouth because they're expected. But like, how can I physically let them know emotionally, spiritually, mentally, let them know that I love them mm -hmm. forward, things that I do, places that I go, creating memories instead of a monetary moment. It's interesting, I think, how many individuals who have, got, like yourself and myself, who have gone through traumatic loss, we measure abundance differently now. It isn't yeah. just about material abundance. It's about the abundance and the quality of the relationships in our lives. It's about not taking life or any day for granted, letting our loved ones know whenever we have the opportunity that we love them and that they value us and and I think that also aligns with the Tadashi and Calhoun's model of post-traumatic growth, where there are growth in, 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 in a shift in our priorities, a shift in our values, a shift in how mm -hmm. we, we mm -hmm. see relationships. And I align with what you've learned because of much of that is what I've learned as well, too. And I also have learned that relationships do not die because the physical body is no longer present. Oh, no. Relationships go on. We can transform those relationships so that we can have continued bonds with our loved ones and they become a part of our life and they're integrated into our daily activities and they're integrated into the best parts of ourselves. So I really firmly believe that. Absolutely. On your website is this declaration of hope. And I love this passage. Turn your baggage into building blocks. What steps do you take to help other women or other individuals who request your services achieve this transformation? First of all, you have to be real with where you are. You can't bullshit yourself, to be honest. If you're in grief, you're in grief. If you're in depression, you're in depression. If you're actively searching for a solution, you can find it. If you're actively searching for an excuse, you will find it. Um, so just First of all, understanding where you're at, understanding where you fall within your grief as well, because there's, I classify it as three phases. So we have the, they have the model out there, the, what is it? The maiden, the mother, and the crone. Yep. 
I liken those into grief as well, the maiden, the mother, and the crone. When it first happens, you are definitely the maiden. You're full of emotion. You are on a whim. All these things. When you're the mother, you're like, you have more knowledge. You have more wherewithal, more understanding. And then when you're the crone, it's okay. Now I can help guide others through this. And so understanding in that model where you fall, in my mind. And so... Once you know that, then you can understand, okay, where do I need the most support? Where do I need the most knowledge, like the most help, the most like, where do I need this person in my life? I help you pretty much. If it's just to help you through grief, that's such a broad sentence. Okay, which part of grief? What are you struggling with? Where are you having the issue at? And then once you build that, so the building blocks come in, you take the first step by understanding where you're at. Then you're going to build on it with the next step and then the next step and the next step. And that going through the phases of grief um, and not in the phases of grief, like the regular traditional phases, because they're not they're not linear and you don't just go through one and cross it off, check mark it off and be like, OK, done with that one on to the next one. Giving yourself toolboxes and resources. I think for me, the longest one that I'd been in was the anger, the mm -hmm. rage station stage, I should say, of like, why is this happening? What's the purpose of this? Why, like, why did this happen to us? And so that's the longest one for me because I'm a doer. I don't like to sit down and just wait for things to happen. I like to make things happen. Yeah. I, uh, Probably not always the best, but that's what I like to do. Hey, at least if you're making things happen and it doesn't turn out the way you expected it to or thought it was going to, you have learned by doing as opposed to taking a passive approach. Yeah. Right. And then I can spin on a heel and turn on a dime and go in another direction. But I'm never like, I don't think that grief is this just one size fits all kind of category to put no. people in. But I think that's how it's churned out by mass media. Like grief is this one thing, and it, but it's not. No. There's so many intricacies that are designed into it and so many different personalities coming into it. There's so many various ways. Um, I shouldn't even say ways, but so many various like intricacies mm -hmm. for each person that grief means something different to each one and how they're going to process it and deal with it and heal with it is going to be different. The expression of grief and, and the trajectory of grief is depending on so many factors. The nature of the relationship with the person who tra who transitioned or died or passed, however you, you conceptualize death. The cause of death has its own unique issues as well, too. And there's, there's just so many different factors. And the cultural expectations or cultural norms or yeah. mores regarding the expression of grief are different for everybody. Yeah, you're right. It isn't just one size fits all. And... We need to respect those individual differences in the grieving process and begin to and learn to align with that. The other thing that I like about the process that you utilize to help women transform and transcend, transcend tragedy is that there's no time frame attached to this. It's no. How long, however long it's going to take for them to move from the raw yep. pain of loss to acceptance that they can accept the fact that their loved ones is no longer a physical part of this universe but they're willing to re-engage in life with meaning and purpose and a commitment to service. It takes as long as you want it to take. Yep. Um, and so if you want it to be a fast track, then that's on you. If you want it to take longer, and maybe you don't know how long you want it to take. It's just going to take as long as it takes for you. There's so many differences because I used to think, I just want to fast track. I just want it to be done. I want it to be over with. I don't want to deal with it no more. And then I obviously started learning and healing and realized that's just not going to happen. No, no. Everybody will go and go through the through grief at their own pace. As long as there is movement, time is relative. An illusion. It's all an illusion. That's right. There's this teaching from the afterlife of Billy Fingers by Annie Kagan. that says life is sometimes illusion posing as truth. And... Truer words were never spoken. It is. That is so insane, but it's true. Oh, yeah, that, that's played out many times. Or at least I believe it anyway. 
Well, I, be I believe it along with you. So there's at least two of us, Faith, that believe it. Well, at least three if he said it too. That's right. That's true too. And four when you count his sister Annie. Your podcast, the Relief Grief Podcast, tell us what inspired the creation of your podcast and how is the podcast an extension or complement to what you do to help others transform their grief? So the creation of the podcast, I felt this, I don't go by traditional means. I don't know if you know that about me yet. I don't use traditional methodologies uh, for how I do things and create things. I felt this stirring in my soul that people's voices weren't getting heard, that people had stories to share and they weren't getting told and they didn't have a platform. Mm -hmm. I created the Release Grief podcast because I thought that, and I still believe it 100%, that if you share your story, it will release portion of that grief, even if it's just to tell your story for the first time. The anger and the anguish with which you feel, the desperation, the, the despair, all the things, but also including the happiness and the things that you've created out of that, um, that grief. And I wanted to give a voice to that. And so we talk about on the podcast, my gosh, there's been, we've talked about suicide. We've talked about um, shaming guilt. We've talked about one gentleman came, uh, was on and he had talked about losing a million dollars in a deal and the shame and the guilt that goes behind that. So it's various types of grief. But getting that story out there so that it doesn't eat you alive. Yep. The women that I help, it's a simple fact that you don't just go through one episode of grief. Like, you're dealing with grief every day in multiple mm -hmm. different ways. So you don't say you apply for a job and you don't get it. That's grief. Mm -hmm. You're like, damn it. That should have been mine. What did I do wrong? And then we start to internalize it and do all these things. So it's not necessarily anything that you did wrong. It's just the fact that might not have been a good fit for you. And I believe that the universe is always conspiring for your best interest. And so with the podcast, I just wanted it to also be known that there's other griefs out there. And it sounds so cliche, but it's okay. They're going through this. Way different than what I'm going through right here, right now. Oh my gosh. I don't know how they made it through that. But, oh my gosh, I feel so, so much empathy for them. So sorry for the situation that they're in. Mine's not as bad. Yeah. But we also have these day-to-day -day ones. Mm -hmm. I had one lady on that, I think she was 22, and she was in college and working full-time jobs, and she went to the eye doctor. And the eye doctor told her that her eyes were swimming in spinal fluid at 22 years old. And so she had these rare conditions. And her life completely changed on a different trajectory after that. But she started a nonprofit. She's going through, I think she just went through her seventh or eighth surgery, I believe. But there's so many different nuances to all these stories of grief. And if we can just combine and collaborate and communicate with each other, it doesn't feel so damn bad. It doesn't feel so damn alone. That's what it is for me. Well, and you're, you're right. Grief comes in all different forms. There's loss due to death. There's loss not due to death. There's a loss of function. There's a loss of, if there's a divorce or person loses a job or doesn't get a job. But they all compound on each other. Yep. They compound. Yep. And it's hard to peel them away and figure out, okay, what is the true grief for the loss? Let's isolate it to this one moment. Can you do that? It's super freaking hard. Yep. You have all these other little pieces that like attach themselves to it. So, And I think every loss that we have experienced prior to the loss that has brought us to our moment of truth plays into the intensity of our grief for that current loss. And also we can, as, as grief support specialists, counselors, therapists, we can talk to individuals about what did you do to help you get through those other losses? What are some strengths that we could play on so that you could, that we can apply to this situation to help you get through this particular moment? So I think it has utility on so many different levels, Faith. I agree, because I know that when we first learned about Cassandra's passing, I'm a doer. I told you that already. Like, yep. I'm a problem solver. I like to think of different ways to solve problems. And when that tragedy hit our family, I was lost. 
because I didn't have a solution for this problem. Mm -hmm. And that one took me out for a very long time. Like I've written it in my book. I've talked about it on multiple podcasts. Like I literally just sat on the back patio staring into the backyard for days. We, I don't even know how long. Nothing, that's what I call the nothingness. Nothing mattered in my world at that moment in time. Not absolutely nothing. Didn't matter if I ate, didn't matter if I slept, didn't matter if my kids were okay or not. Nothing mattered. Yeah. I think time as we knew it stopped yes. and revolved around dealing with the emotions and dealing with, with the loss and, and asking the question, how are we going to get through another day without the physical presence of our children? Right. How do I solve this problem? Yeah. And for me, it was, how do I, what solution here? Yep. I can't fabricate, create a solution for this problem because the only solution is to bring her back. Yeah, it took me quite a while to figure out that wasn't going to happen. During the first year, things felt real surreal for me. And I kept thinking, yeah. Janine's going to come down and tell me, hey, Dad, it was all of uh, I know, it's going to be like big old weird yeah. joke. Something like, yeah. I just got, gotcha. I gotcha, I'm back. And then when, right. it, when, it, when a year and one day hit faith, I realized that. This is my reality moving forward, which is why I tell individuals a lot of times for many individuals, the second year is worse than the first because the reality yeah. of the, the second year hits in is that this is going to be my life moving year, forward. The first year, you're yeah. stuck in belief. Yeah. yeah. Belief, they're going to show up. Yeah. Belief, they're going to pull in the drive. Because she lived out of town, so yeah. we didn't see her all the time. Yeah. So it's almost like she was going to come back and visit for a weekend or a day or an hour or whatever. And it was never going to happen. No, but it's happened in other ways. And I'm sure you correct. I can attest to that. You can attest to that as well too. So if there's one thing you were going to leave our listeners with today, Faith, what would that be? There's so many to choose from, but I would say you're not doing it wrong. Your grief is yours and it's whatever you make of it. It can be, I've heard people term it as good grief or it can be bad grief. You get to decide and you get to choose. It's still going to hurt, still going to be painful, but do you want it to be on the good side or the bad side and trust yourself to make those decisions? You are capable and it's yours. You just have to own it. And unfortunately with grief, you have to own it. And I think the more authentically we can own our grief, the greater the chances of ours, us moving through grief. I think so, because the more you run from it, the longer it's going to take. But the more you face it and confront it and head right through it, I wouldn't say the quicker and easier it's going to be, but I, it's not going to take as long and it's not going to be as painful. Makes sense. Thank you for that, Faith. Yeah. My last question for you today is if individuals want to get in touch with you, contract for your services, find out more about your book, how can they do that? Faithsage.net. I'm all over social media. I don't know those off the top of my head. Just search Faithsage on any of the platforms I'm on it. Obviously, some I'm on more than others because when I alluded back going into copywriting back in 14 they're like oh you should have a social media presence so i got on every social media platform but i'm most prevalent on facebook youtube and uh, soon to be tiktok but go to my website all the links are on there faithsage.net and i'll make sure that gets in the program notes when the both the audio and video version of this releases so faith thank you so much for taking time today to be a guest contributor on the Teaching Journeys podcast. I truly enjoyed our conversation and hope we can have more. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me, and I hope they got something out of it anyway. I have no doubt that they will get something out of it. Thank you again, Faith. That is a wrap on another episode of the Teaching Journeys podcast. I'm your host, Dave Roberts, wishing you peace. Bye, everyone.